This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com. As part of our ongoing series on financial repression, I have Tim Price joining us from London. Tim uh, is a well-recognized writer on the web and is the Director of Investment at PFP Wealth Management in the UK in financial planning practice. Welcome, Tim. Morning. Tim, maybe we could kick this off by you giving uh, our listeners a brief overview of your background, uh, your web blog, and um, uh, which is the price of everything and PFP. Sure. Thanks, Gordon. Um, yeah, my background is as follows. I, I joined the capital markets. I entered the capital markets in 1991 as a bond salesman. And uh, this was the only job I could get uh, after having got an English degree. And uh, so I, I, I entered the capital markets without really knowing what a bond was. And uh, I guess I'm in fairly uh, – well, I, I used to think I was in unique territory, but I think actually quite a lot of people are in the same boat. So I don't feel so bad about that anymore. So I spent about 10 years as a bond salesman. And then uh, moved into private client portfolio management. So I now work for a, a portfolio management business called PFP. And I, as you you say, I have a I run a uh, maintain a blog at uh, the price of everything. Um, so if you search for the price of everything at a, a type pad, you'll you'll find the blog as well. Tim, we're here to, today to discuss financial repression. Uh, how would you explain it to our listeners? Um, what the macro prudential policy of financial repression is. I, I think you could sum up financial repression quite, quite, uh, quite easily, quite pithily uh, as government stealing from savers. Um, <laughs> and if I was going to expand it, it would be government stealing from savers and stealing from the future. Could you expand on that? Yeah. Um, the, the, I, as far as I view the world, and it may be that I'm sort of laboring under this sort of, you know, having all this bond market baggage behind me, but I tend to view the world through the, the prism of debt. And as I would suggest, the, 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 the single biggest problem of our times economically is that there's been, for the last 40 years, there's been an unsustainable buildup of, uh, of, of credit, uh, of credit expansion throughout the developed world. And we've reached the end of the road now. So pretty much every policy by central banks, um, by governments and their agent central banks is designed, A, to kick the can down the road. Um, and B, to do precisely, conduct the, the precise activity of stealing from, from savers to keep this bandwagon rolling. Tim, you probably do a lot of travel or at least talking to clients around the world. How broad based is this financial repression, these policies? I think, it, I think it's everywhere. I mean, if you look at those central banks that are conducting, have conducted or are likely to conduct the policy of quantitative easing, then it's pretty much everybody. Um, so the, the U.S. Federal Reserve has clearly has clearly been, you know, a, a, a prime mover in this regard. The Bank of England has been no slouch when it comes to, to QE. The ECB, you know, the European Central Bank, currently looks like a bit of a holdout, but uh, one suspects that pretty soon they'll they'll sort of get with the program. Um, China's doing it, and the Bank of Japan is now this sort of you know the the inflator, the arch inflationist par excellence. So everyone's at it. Key part of the financial repression is negative real interest rates, and I'm finding that people have a real problem grasping that concept of what it means. Can you help them with that? Well, to, to touch on the on the topic of bonds again, um, I, I think this is where the the whole business of financial repression. It, it, this is the sort of the the, the nerve center of the of the whole policy. If you accept that the problem with the West is that we've had this an unsustainable uh, build-up uh, of debt over not just the last few years, but the last, say, 40 years or so, certainly ever since Nixon took the dollar off gold in 1971, if you accept that the, the single biggest problem is, is uh, an oversupply of debt that's frankly unsustainable, then logically there are only three ways to, to attempt to resolve it. The first is that you, you have enough economic growth to keep servicing the debt. And I would suggest that that that, that is, is no longer 
achievable, certainly in the context of the Eurozone, which seems to be literally submerging, you know, sinking into, into a sort of deflationary depression. So if you discount economic growth, then the second option for trying to deal with this mountain of debt is repudiation. It's default. We also operate in a, in a debt based monetary system. So all the money that we use was lent into being by the banks. So the business of paying down debt, extinguishing debt, deleveraging is also destructive of money. And a, a default in a debt based monetary system, a default by any major government would be the economic equivalent of Armageddon. So let's, let's, let's sort of pass, let, let's sort of, you know, let's, let's pass by option number two. By a process of logic and elimination, you get to option number three. So what's in the box marked three? Option number three is an explicit policy of state sanctioned inflationism. And it is also the policy that governments throughout the ages have always reverted to. So in a, in the context of a fiat monetary system, a fiat currency system where the currency, the currencies of the world no longer have any form of tangible backing, then ultimately every government goes down the route of money printing and they go too far because this is all really, I think, about um, a lack of political will, a lack of political discipline. So again, throughout the West, you've had governments and politicians overspending um, and the, uh, and they they've been you know that 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 bandwagon is sort of rolled merrily along. So politicians' promises have got bigger and bigger and bigger. The ability of the state to pay for those promises has, has got smaller and smaller and smaller relatively. And I it, it strikes me that we're we're sort of pretty close to the end of the road now. So that the the option number three that we've, we're already into well into is official state sanctioned inflationism, and that's where we get to effectively the government both implicitly and explicitly stealing from savers and stealing from the future because the people who are going to be are going to really have to to bear the brunt of this are those people who are not even yet born but they're going to have to cope with the debt as well what's the end game or is there an end game well it's a good question i mean i i can't claim to have a, 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 any sort of clearer crystal ball than the next person but certainly since the credit crisis began in 2007 and certainly since lehman failed in 2008 it's the, the the question I've been wrestling with, as I'm sure all investors have everywhere, is what is that? What's that? What's the outcome in the near term? Is the outcome deflation or is the outcome inflation? And I think now, I think clearly we have some kind of an answer. So in the short run, the outcome, bizarrely, in a fiat world, is actually deflationary. And it's astonishing to think that in a world where paper can be conjured up. Ex nihilo money can be printed out of nowhere and put into circulation. It, it seems extraordinary that you could end up with a deflationary outcome. And yet here we are. And, and the best way I've heard, I think this described is there's, um, a fund manager that I met back in 2000 who happened to be a fund manager investing in Japan. Uh, Japan being the, you know, the, the object lesson here. Um, and he said something that's always lived with me ever since. He said, Japan was the dress rehearsal. And the rest of the world will be the main event. Now, 14 years ago, that sounded silly to me. It does, it no longer sounds silly to me. It sounds very, very scary. It sounds very, very prescient. Especially after the Halloween surprise we just went through. Absolutely. So again, if, if, in a sense, you, you kind of now feel what, what's the future? Or well, maybe the future is Japan. And you look at Japan and people say, that you know, people write off Japan as if it's had, you know, it's gone nowhere for, for, for two decades. In a sense, that's true, but actually the, the Japanese have coped very well with a, an economy that just hasn't grown, that's just sort of tracked sideways. The Japanese are, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the right word, stoic is probably the right word. These people are clearly capable of putting up with an awful lot, and they are a very socially cohesive uh, people. I very much doubt whether the economies of the rest of the West w will cope as easily faced with the same kind of problems that Japan has been facing now for 20-odd years. I would venture to say there will be a lot higher level of social unrest uh, and pushback as the problems become more and more blatant, uh, and the government's regulatory intrusions become harsher and more pronounced, if I can use those, those words. Tim, as an investor, what should investors be doing? Um, how should they be protecting themselves right now? 
It's a very good question. And, and again, I don't think anybody has, has all the answers here, but I can tell you how, how, you know, we, how we're going about this process, how we're going about attempting to preserve our clients' capital and ideally generate a sort of a, a, an absolute return on top. So the way we, we view the world is we break the world down into four asset types. Um, we break the, we, we view the world through sort of four prisms, if you like. Um, and those prisms are firstly that of objectively high quality debt, which sounds like a, a sick joke given where, you know, where interest rates are throughout the world. But we'd still argue that today there are pockets of value, uh, e- even in the bond market, which feels like the biggest bubble in history. So one pillar to this process is, is high quality debt. And we can maybe talk a little bit about that. The second pillar for us is explicitly deep value listed equity so buying into quality companies with high quality able competent shareholder management and ideally buying those shares uh, at a discount to their their intrinsic uh, worth intrinsic value the third leg to this approach the third pillar is um uncorrelated assets and more specifically that that for us that we, we view the third pillar as being uh, specifically concentrated in a, in a hedge fund strategy that's known as uh, systematic trend following. So uh, uh, it, the, the, the jargon in the trade is CTA or commodity trading advisors. But specifically what we're looking at are funds that are managed on a trend following, a systematic trend following basis. And what's interesting about this approach is that if you look at the world of active fund management, probably 99% of managers try and predict the future. We would argue that particularly in this weird uh, and very unsettling financial environment, trying to predict the future is, is just impossible. It's, it's, it's a mugs game. So wh- what we see as the huge advantage of a trend following fund is there's no attempt to try and predict the, the outcome of, of all these, you know, a- absurd monetary experiments. What a trend following fund does is simply tries to, a, a typical fund will simply try and hitch a ride on a pronounced trend in any given asset market, typically through futures contracts. And the reason why we view this as a bellwether part of a, of a, of a client's portfolio is uh, a typical trend following fund will be just as happy to ride a market trend up, i.e. prices rising, and they'll be just as happy to ride a trend down. In other words, they'll be quite happy to sell into weakness. And trend following funds, for example, did fabulously well in 2008. So when most uh, financial markets, when most financial assets were really under pressure um, and they were sinking like a stone, um, trend following funds did, did brilliantly. And if one is concerned about, you know, a 2008 a reprise of 2008, a reprise of a, a dysfunctional, um, almost systemic failure uh, by the system, then I think trend following funds really have a, a potentially a place to, uh, a, a, a part to play in any portfolio. The fourth leg of this four leg approach is what we call real assets and including included in the real assets component would be the likes of gold and silver, the monetary metals. Now, clearly for the last couple of years, you know, in money terms, in dollar terms, for example, the likes of gold and silver haven't haven't worked out. So you've had a fairly brutal um, trade south in, in price terms, but we are playing a long game here. I am personally convinced that before this crisis is out, we're going to see um, gold trading in in money terms at levels way higher than than the recent high of sort of 2011. And those four those four pillars are how we're trying to sort of navigate these very troubled waters. Would you say they're equal in distribution, or is that jumping to too big a conclusion? Pretty much. I mean, I think the if this this sort of multi multifaceted approach has any value and, and again time will tell um but if this approach has any value it will have value because it's it which what it, to our way of thinking it offers genuine diversification so you know the whole the whole premise of this approach is that we don't know what the future holds we are simply trying to hedge against as many different outcomes as possible so for example high objectively high quality debt debt issued by unimpeachable quality issuers should do should protect very well against outright deflation and again it it, it strikes us that you know in in quite in quite a number of countries right now particularly in the eurozone the you know we, we seem to be you know staring deflation in the face so high quality bonds will offer protection there 
listed value equities should do well under most scenarios and certainly should do tolerably well in an environment of moderate inflation. The, the trend followers, as I say, I think are frankly bellwether investments. So in an ideal world, they'll do pretty well come hell or high water. We would view them as Armageddon insurance, frankly. And then the monetary metals, particularly the likes of gold and silver, uh, bullion and, and maybe some of the, the larger mining concerns, um, to give you a sort of a, lever, a levered uh, exposure to, to bullion. Um, ideally, those will, will hedge in the future, will hedge against, uh, let's say, a sort of rather messy and uncontrolled inflation. And it may not be precisely equal allocations to each, but certainly we'd want some skin in the game in every in every area. So we'd probably want a minimum of maybe 10% or so of a client portfolio into each of those areas, because otherwise it's not, it doesn't represent diversification anymore. Exactly. I've had so many of my guests have stressed uh, diversification, and they've even stressed diversification within the uh, hard metals, gold, silver, platinum, et cetera, and various mixes there. But uh, just on the on your fourth uh, leg of the stool, hard assets, are there other hard assets that you've considered, uh, land, farmland, forestry, ex- uh, any others? Yeah, the, these are all these are all good ideas. So they're, they're all relevant. They all they all they all have a role to play. We we haven't tended to focus on real estate because. For most of our clients, that's already probably their single largest allocation by dint of their, their primary residence alone. So, and also we, we were not finding, to be honest, terrific, you know, value opportunities in, in, in real estate. Um, I mean, anyone that's been over to London, uh, or, or certainly, you know, the, the more she-she parts of London recently, uh, can tell you that the property probably isn't exactly cheap right now. Uh, but in a more general sense, yeah, real estate is clearly a part of that real assets component, or it can be. And yes, forestry too, timber, you know, these are all, these are all great ways of, of, of getting sort of, uh, tangible, non-financial, um, exposure. Uh, the other thing I'd add, and it's, it's, it's not an asset class specific observation as such. I think, and this is from a, a friend of ours who's a, a fund manager in, in Switzerland. The three characteristics of assets that he wants to hold right now, and we, we are with him all the way on this, are those things that are independent, i.e. independent of not least as a very fraught uh, financial system, th- those things that are independent, that are scarce, and that are permanent. So I think those three qualities, independence, scarcity, and permanence, are absolutely the kind of things that people should be holding as investments or assets right now. Tim, what kinds of things are keeping you up at night worrying about your portfolios? Um, it's, it's not so much the portfolios that, the, 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 let's say the, the sort of day to day price volatility that, that, that gives us sort of misgivings. We think we've got the, the bases pr- pretty broadly covered. And just on that point about volatility, I think it's also, um, a question that people should be asking themselves. As far as the, re- the financial regulators tend to view the markets and, and clearly the business of investment and investment management is a very highly regulated industry. As far as the regulators tend to view this world, I think it's fair to say they tend to view risk as primarily uh, a function of, of price volatility. I would prefer personally to view risk as the risk of permanent loss of capital. So in other words, what, what, what does keep me awake is the idea that we might be exposed to things that represent a risk of a permanent loss of capital. And clearly we've tried as hard as we can do in a somewhat, uh, in, a, in a, in a flawed world to, you know, to, to, to concentrate on, 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 on areas where that, that, that permanent loss of capital is, uh, is unlikely to happen. It's, it's so critical. Uh, uh, tail risk and, and, and drawdowns, uh, you can't recover for a long period of time. Very, very difficult. Everybody knows that. Uh, but it's so easy to be lulled in as these, in especially the United States with the markets continuing to go higher and the risk, in my mind, going up ex- exponentially with it. Regulation, which goes with financial repression. Do you have concerns there of changing yes. laws, tax laws, et cetera? Yeah, again, I mean, uh, uh, when I sort of started, I wasn't sort of being flippant when I said, you know, the, the idea, uh, my, my definition would be one of government stealing from savers. And that clearly can be done in all kinds of ways. So, uh, one, one conceivable way, for example, and this is the kind of thing that banana republics, you know, used to do, but I think these kind of policies could well leak into the so-called developed world is you go to bed on Friday and you have a hundred pounds or a hundred dollars in your bank account. And then you wake up on Monday and th- through some sort of extraordinary government action, you find out you thought you had a hundred dollars, 
turns out you've only got $90. The government has sort of introduced emergency legislation and it's basically taken 10% of your assets away. So I think whether it's sort of overt or or covert, then I think, yeah, the, the, a more generalized trend towards government sequestration of private capital, you know, that, that, that risk is that risk is high and rising. And of course, the the, sorry, the best way of the best one of the best ways of doing this is simply through stealth, namely by inflation. Yeah, that's why I asked it because this is um, our listeners' their biggest concern right now, and how rapid, uh, whether announced or unannounced, laws and regulations are coming in, and they're kind of hearing them from their tax accountants or their lawyers and saying, "I didn't realize that." Um, and the, but the degree of which it which it's happening, and I'm wondering if you could give any visibility to that yourself that you're seeing or worried about. Well, this, the, uh, I noticed there was a very interesting piece uh, from an analyst, Russell Napier, um, this last week. And he, he talks, I'm not sure quite what his source, uh, who or what his source might be, but he was strongly implying that, uh, at a, uh, uh, that this weekend there's going to be a G20 meeting. And one outcome of that meeting is that the basically the rights of depositors in banks are going to be eroded, uh, namely that the, you know, the, 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 the primacy of capital for for a deposit holder is going to be is going to be badly eroded in the event of a the next failing bank so in other words cyprus when we had the bail in in cyprus uh in the eurozone crisis which is a sort of roiling an ongoing crisis it's like ongoing black comedy um pretty much established a template for for bail ins and you get the feeling that you no know, depositors worldwide now should be looking quite carefully at the effectively at the the counterparty quality of of the bank that they're with because you get you get the sense that the way the authorities are moving is all deposit all deposit of money now is fair game there's no question about it uh the restriction of the bail ins is i think was a a, a seminal event in in uh, it'll go down in history of financial shift of of thinking and and policy and what we're even seeing is restrictions on money markets of certain size here in, in America already coming in, and which is a little frightening. A counterparty risk is comes in many shapes and forms, and in you know being liquid. And you had a beautiful quote here, one of your writings about distressed sellers. Yeah, this this was something I heard back in the, the dark days of 2008, when the you know the, the system felt like it was sort of flying apart at the seams. And I was at a, an investment conference, and one of the speakers made the following remark. They said that if you're a distressed seller of an illiquid asset in a, in a panicky market environment, it is worse than being in a crowded theater that's on fire. It's, they said it's, it's like being in a crowded theater that's on fire. And the only way you can get out is by persuading someone outside to swap places with you. That says it all. And that's the kinds of, 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 of events that we could see or will see, uh, in the future, because at some point these financial repression is, it's hurting uh, capitalism and, and the extensions, the distortions, the malinvestments, the mispricing of risk that we have right now. I've never seen it in my, in my uh, career, uh, at this level. And at some way, at some point it has to adjust. And that's what it'll be like. It'll be counterparties, uh, that you think are there that, that won't be able to deliver. There will be a li- liquidity that will suddenly just completely disappear. Um, and governments will step in, and when they step in, the, the, the rules or regulations they bring can, in fact, maybe bring some stability, but they may not be your friend. I don't mean to sound frightening, but. I, th- I think that the sort of the watchword really is, is it's better to be, better to be a month too early than, a, than an hour too late. Precisely. So be prepared. Clearly, your, your approach to portfolio management on your four legs is a diversified, balanced, total return kind of approach here. Correct. And we got to wrap. What would be the key message you'd like to leave with our investors and listeners? I think I, w- I would. I would try and be as upbeat as possible and say only the paranoid survive. <laughs> but the, I'll use the word prudent, but that, <laughs> I guess yeah, it's one and it's one and the same. Tim, can you tell our listeners where they could learn more about your writings, your work, um, the things you're but involved? By with? all means, uh, people are welcome to you know, to follow the blog, which is the price of everything. Uh, dot typepad. dot com. And uh, I have been known to to partake of the the gigantic time sink that is Twitter. So uh, people can find me uh, at Tim F. Price on Twitter if they feel so uh, so inclined. Thank you very much for the time. Great interview, great discussion. I look forward to having you back again. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Gordon. Thank you, Tim. Bye. Bye-bye. 
This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com. 